So Acts chapter 13, we will be picking up in verse 14. We got about halfway, well, probably about a third of the way through the chapter. This is a really long chapter, and believe it or not, we're going to get the rest of the way through it today. Um, so buckle your seatbelt. But <laughs> a quick review of the book of Acts. Again, this is the birth of the church. This is how the church came to be. And we are now roughly at the midway point of the book. I mean, not, not chapters, numbers speaking, but just about lengthwise, we're roughly at the midway point. And the focus is shifting, as you have undoubtedly noticed these last few weeks. Um, the gospel has now reached the Gentiles. And there are churches just popping up all over the place. It's, a, it's an incredible movement of the Holy Spirit. And it is spreading like wildfire. And the hub of the activity of the church now has moved effectively 300 miles north of Jerusalem to the city Antioch. And last week we saw Paul and Barnabas journey along with John Mark from Antioch to Cyprus. And they sailed up the Mediterranean, landed on the coast of Perga, of Pamphylia, in the region of Galatia. And at that point, John Mark departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. And this week, we will see Paul and Barnabas continue here in Galatia. But remember, our theme as we move through this book comes out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, which says, Rejoice always, and pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So jumping right in, verse 14. But when they had departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So this is a different Antioch than what we had discussed last week. Uh, this is right in the heart of Galatian territory. It's about 400 miles northwest of the Antioch that we had discussed last week. It's about 150 miles north of the Mediterranean Sea, where they had landed in Perga. And my understanding is that most of that 150 miles is an uphill climb. <laughs> so this was quite a journey inland for them. Paul and Barnabas, though, they keep with what will be the standard pattern throughout their missionary journeys. If there was a synagogue in the area, they would go there first, and they would present the gospel to the Jews. And then they would take the word to the Gentiles. And we'll get into that a little bit more here in a little bit. In verse 15, it says, And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Now, this was customary in any given synagogue. They would begin service simply by reciting the Shema, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then they would offer their prayer. And then there would be a reading from the law, which was Genesis to Deuteronomy. And then there would be a sermon on that reading. And at that point, if there were any visiting rabbis to the synagogue that weekend, they would be invited to speak. They would basically give them the pulpit. <laughs> And they would have known that Paul was a great teacher of the law. His name was well known in this particular system. So this would have been a really big deal for them. I mean, think about, like, Billy Graham's here this week, or Greg Laurie's here this week, and Charles Spurgeon's here this week. We've got Saul. I mean, they remember him as Saul, but it's Paul now. Um, we've got him here. Let's hear what he's got to say. So they asked him, would you like to speak? <laughs> and there's a piece that is buried in this that we just kind of brushed over last week with, in Galatians um, during the midweek study. Now, somewhere here between Cyprus and into Galatia, Paul very likely contracted malaria. And remember, at this point for him, he has been through 12 to 14 years of preparation and just waiting for the Lord to call him out into the mission field. And at this point, he is ready to hit the ground running. But now he's affected with a condition that impacts his eyes specifically. And he truly struggled with this. Physically, it would have been very, very painful. It's just an obstruction to what they were trying to do. Visibly, it would have greatly impacted his appearance. People would have known something was going on. At best, at very best, it would have caused his eyes to be weepy and crusty, and it goes downhill from there if it was worse. Um, they would, people would have known something was going on. And So as they head further inland here, Paul enters this particular synagogue in utter humility and weakness. There's not much you can do to hide your eyes. You just you can't. Uh, there's not much you can do that your sight doesn't directly affect. And this would have had a huge hindrance on what he was trying to do. And this is so typical of our God. He's not mean. He's not mean-spirited. But he so often uses us where we are least comfortable. And where our weakness is most apparent. 
In this way, we have to lean on him to get through it. In this way, the glory can only ever go to God. There's nothing about us worth speaking of because the power is from God. And this is the way that God chose to operate here. And Paul recognized that. We're going to get into that. But the leader of the synagogue basically offers the pulpit to Paul. You care to offer a word from the Lord? And Paul says, sure. <laughs> and I need you to picture how this would have played out. you got this man who's squinty and crusty-eyed and in obvious discomfort, finding his way to the front of the room. And he stumbles up there and just in humility offers a word from the Lord. And Paul himself, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, says that the people said of him, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is contemptible. This is what they said about him, and this is what he knew they said about him, and he I apparently agreed with it. <laughs> he wasn't a powerful speaker, and he wasn't much to look at. And this is all compounded by whatever is happening here with his eyes. So this is how he comes before this crowd with this message. If you want to turn real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Just a couple books to the right there. In this section he wrote, it might be about specifically about what's going on with his eyes here. It might be about something completely different. We don't know for sure. But this was his attitude toward such things. Toward such things that the Lord placed in his life and allowed to happen in his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So whether this was about his eyes or something else entirely, the message here still applies directly to what he's going through in this moment. God's grace is sufficient for you. Think about that in the midst of humility or in the midst of weakness or of suffering. God's grace is sufficient and his strength is made perfect in weakness. When I am weak, then I am strong. And I ask you honestly, when are we not weak? Ever. <laughs> Outside of the Lord, we are weak. That simple realization that we are weak, that simple truth is a great evaporator of pride. We are always weak, but God is always strong. We deceive ourselves when we think anything different. Back in Acts, though, when the synagogue ruler asks if Paul has anything to say in his weakness, and Paul is not at all discouraged by whatever people might say of him or of his appearance or of his presentation. He just goes for it. He cares only that these people hear what God has to say. He says, sure. And what we have next here is Paul's first recorded sermon in Scripture. And certainly not the last. But we're really just going to read this for what it is. And this is not a cop-out. It is solid, solid teaching. There's not much to add to it. <laughs> But what you're going to see as we go through this, there are very strong, very strong similarities both between when Peter addressed the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4 and in Acts chapter 5, and there are strong similarities with what Stephen preached to the Sanhedrin before they stoned him in Acts chapter 7. And in that, understand that Paul was in the room for all three of those accounts. He heard all of those addresses. He will start here from the roots he will offer the history of the nation Israel and the law, just like Stephen did. He will trace that history into the lineage of Jesus Christ. And he will reveal the blindness of the teachers of the law. The reality of who Jesus was, just like Peter did. And then he'll tell the story of how Jesus was killed unjustly and how he rose again. And how he is now seated on the throne in heaven, just like Peter and just like Stephen did. And remember, he heard these addresses. He'll give the history, he'll give the prophecy, 
He'll give the gospel, and then he'll give a call to repentance. He clearly heard Peter's words. He clearly heard Stephen's words. Clearly, the images of Stephen committing his spirit into the hands of the Father, begging for forgiveness of his killers with his dying breath, that would have stuck with Paul. The thing to understand in that is God's word has staying power, even when it seems like you are not getting through at all, or when whoever you're speaking with seems as though they could care less, or when they're downright attacking you. God can still bury that word deep inside of them, even if they're rejecting it exterior, ex- on the exterior. He buries it so he can draw it back up in his time. You never know simply the work that God is going to do in a heart. We can't tell that. We can't judge that, but God knows. And he promises us that his word will not return void to him. That does not mean we will see the fruition of it, but it will not return void to him. He sees the fruition. And here we see the fruition of things Peter and Stephen preached in Paul's life, and they are not there to watch this happen. Where in the moment that they delivered these messages to their audience, they thought they were failing, perhaps. And Peter walked away severely beaten from his message. Stephen didn't walk away at all. He died. But God's word lives. Don't be discouraged when it doesn't seem like it's being received. His word has power beyond what we can see in the temporary. In verse 16, it says, Then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus, after John had first preached, before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you this, the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he also says in another psalm, You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his father, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And I want to pause there just for a second. Look at those two verses there, verses 38 and 39. If you ever want a gospel message, that's it. That is the entire gospel in two sentences. This man, Jesus, is the forgiveness of sins. And by him, 
and by him alone, everyone who believes will be justified from all things which the law cannot justify. The thing is, the law cannot save us. It cannot redeem us. It can only condemn us. But it is Jesus who fulfilled the law, who saves and redeems, and we are justified through him. Verse 40, it says, Beware, therefore, lest what, the prophet, what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So Paul closes out with a pretty stern warning. And the thing is, now the warning applies to you as well this morning. And God is working a work in our days. We live in an extraordinary time. And this time right now, I don't know that we're ever going to see another time like this, where he has eliminated basically every distraction from our society. There's a freedom to a family schedule right now that has not been there in decades. There's not places for your kids to be every night of the week. There's a freedom once things start rolling again that we just might not see again. There's a plague that is wreaking havoc on this world. And there are unrest and discord ruling our nightly headlines. And God is working a work so that people might be able to see how frail their own security truly is. And that they might be able to see who he truly is. And that in him there is hope and rest and peace and security. But there will be many in that who do not believe. Even though one were to declare it to you. And it is being declared to you in the words of Paul this morning. Don't be always hearing and never believing. And Jesus, only Jesus can save you. Only Jesus can fill the emptiness that you are feeling. And only Jesus can give you freedom and victory over the things that have beaten you down. And Paul challenges the synagogue and he challenges you, he challenges you because it sounds too good to be true. It can't be this simple. But it is true. The question is, will you disregard it? Will you try and find hope elsewhere? Or will you believe that Jesus is exactly who he says he is? Will you entrust your life to him? In verse 42, it says, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking to, the, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So it says flat out, many of the Jews and proselytes in the synagogue hear this word from Paul, and they follow this teaching, and Paul and Barnabas persuade them to continue in the grace of God. Continue in the grace of God, because the flat out truth is it gets awfully rocky outside of that. It was a remarkably telling and a prescient encouragement from Paul and Barnabas, because when Paul writes the epistle to the Galatians a couple of years from this point, and this is what we're going through during the midweek study, this is the exact thing that they have not done. And they will discount God's grace, and they will chase after keeping the law, and they encourage those who were never subject to the law in the first place to become subject to the law. It is a terrible thing that they do. The Paul writes them in that time with the same encouragement that he gave this crowd here. And it is a tremendous encouragement for whatever it is you might be facing this morning. Continue in the grace of God. If it is defeat or discouragement or failure, if you've fallen, if you feel trapped again by something you thought you were rid of a long time ago, something you feel you should have had well in hand by now, if the enemy won't get out of your ear and telling you how unworthy you are, if your relationships are strained, if you're under attack, if you're sick, if you're suffering, you continue on in the grace of God. The unmerited favor of the gift of salvation through the blood of his son. Salvation for anyone, regardless of who you are or what you have done, comes simply by giving your life into the hands of Jesus Christ the King. But I want you to see this here. This is a miraculous thing that happens. The Jews went out of the synagogue talking about what Paul had just preached. And what happened? The Gentiles begged that these same words might be preached to them on the next Sabbath. Now just think about that. 
The majority of Paul's message, the overwhelming majority of Paul's message was history and prophecy, which on its surface is pretty dry hearing, right? And that same history and that same prophecy was read every single Sabbath in this synagogue. That's, why, that's what they did. They went there, they read the law, they read the prophets. So the question is, is that the piece that these people were begging to hear? Is that the piece that the people in the synagogue were discussing when they left its doors? The history and the prophecy? I would offer to you that that's not what it was. It's something they could have heard any other week. The people leaving the synagogue were speaking of this gospel of grace. That was what was new. That in this Jesus, there is forgiveness of sins. And they were speaking about how that lined up with the history and the prophecy that they knew. And the Holy Spirit just sparks this hunger here. Simply in what is being discussed by the people after this message that Paul delivers. And I want you to think about that when you leave from here today. God's audience is always broader than our own. Always. There are always ears in the next restaurant booth, or the next desk at work, or just around the corner from wherever you're talking about the things he has talked to you about. And people that God can reach so often that we don't even realize are there. Think about what it is you say when you leave here, when you go off and eat wherever you eat or go home and talk with your neighbor. You don't have to be speaking directly to somebody for them to be touched by God's word. They can hear it just by it coming out of your mouth. But the Gentiles there begged to hear the same message. So hungry they were for hope and mercy and grace. They didn't need chapter and verse from the law on how they had sinned. They knew something was wrong. Most people know that something is wrong. They fall back on a lot of different devices to try and remove that pain and that guilt brought on by their sin. But they know something's wrong. They know they are not doing right. They know there's an emptiness there that they can't seem to fill. And maybe you feel that emptiness this morning. But here these people come spilling out of the synagogue, speaking of forgiveness and freedom from sin. And the Spirit sparks this thirst in the hearts of the Gentiles to where they're basically saying, please preach this message to us as well. We want to know this grace. In verse 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Now this Antioch in Pisidia was a relatively big city. It was an important commercial center of the region. And the total population is unknown. There are not solid numbers on that. I'm not going to try and guess. But the archaeological findings of that area have uncovered a coliseum there that was capable of seating 15,000 spectators, which is roughly the size of most arenas in the National Basketball Association, just for comparison. So this was a city that can fill a substantial space at will. Think about that. You have here almost the whole city coming together to hear the word. And I don't know how this worked. I mean, at the most, at the least, it was thousands, perhaps tens of thousands. They certainly would not have fit in the synagogue. Perhaps they gathered at that stadium. I don't know. But almost the whole city had been set abuzz by this word of this gospel of grace. And in verse 45 it says, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. In contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Envy can do some really terrible things in very short order. The Jews there start contradicting and blaspheming and opposing the things that Paul had spoken, which, by the way, they really didn't seem to have an issue with when he spoke them. <laughs> but now they see these numbers gathered. And all of a sudden, the exclusivity of what they have always practiced had been removed. They realized that as they watch these numbers come in, it's like this gospel is available to just about anybody. <laughs> it's available to the weak. It's available to the wounded and to the hurting and to the sinful and the shallow and the lost, the people who most definitely do not have their act together, and those who have no regard for the things of God. It's being offered to these, and that's the thing. There's nothing inherent in any one of us worth setting apart, worth saving, except that God showered his grace, his unmerited favor on anybody who would believe. 
these couple of verses of God's overwhelming grace, they open the floodgates for the people who are seeking hope. And just to be rid of that guilt and that emptiness. And seeing this happen, the Jews who were bound up in their tradition and their exclusivity, they begin contradicting and blaspheming the truth of the gospel. And you see roots of this type of effort still stifling the simplicity of God's grace even today. Accepting Jesus for who he is, but then attempting to add anything else to the price of salvation. It's a terrible thing to do, to try and attach merit to that which was just given without merit. Verse 46 says, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And the tragedy in this is that the Jews were roughly on board with what Paul had taught. And at least, at the very least, they were not vehemently opposed to what he said. But then the envy took over and the pride. God's design for the Jews as a nation was to proclaim their Messiah as a light to the Gentiles. In Isaiah chapter 49 Verse 6, speaking of the Messiah, of Jesus, it says, Indeed, he, the Lord, says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. And see in that, God, even then, just another message of him, I'm going to take this outside of your boundaries to the world. Because the next verse says that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And God told them this would happen and what they were supposed to be reading in their daily lives. But now that it is actually happening, now that the light is actually shining to the Gentiles, their envy and their pride takes over and it blinds them to the light. And this is the danger in pride. And we talk about this a whole lot. We say this repeatedly, pride always ultimately serves self. And self has an appetite that knows no bounds. And self will run in the direct opposition to God's will. This walk with Jesus Christ is a continued denial of self. It's a continued surrender of self. And pride is just this devastating roadblock to anybody's walk with Jesus Christ. And this is the same pride that overcame the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's overcoming the people in the synagogue here. And so it's Paul, a Jew among Jews, an expert in the law, and Barnabas, a Levite, who sacrificed his birthright. These two uphold the command to carry Jesus as a light to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth. But Paul, deeply loving his people, he loved his people, he would continue to carry that light to the Jews first, wherever he went. And there would be Jews who would see it. But now the audience is far broader. That's an amazing thing about light. There's a perfection in God choosing that word specifically to portray his salvation and his truth. Light falls where it falls, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's not served to us individually like pudding cups. You know, it's, it, it's, it's there, <laughs> and it's going to fall on who it falls on. You turn a light on in the room... Everyone in the room benefits from that light. The sun doesn't just shine on just your house or just your town or just your country. It literally shines to the ends of the earth. But only those with open eyes ever see it. Only those whose eyes are opened ever come to a belief in Jesus Christ. Verse 48 says, Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. The Gentiles heard this, and they were glad. They were not envious. This word translates out to they rejoiced. It was a celebration. They rejoiced and glorified in the word of the Lord. And then you have this verse here, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. As many as had their eyes opened saw the light. As many as had their hearts softened accepted it. And today, people will spend a whole lot of time debating this particular point over what it means. And the basic truth is that the Bible teaches both God's sovereignty 
and man's responsibility. He teaches both divine appointment and he teaches free will. The tragic truth in life is that there are some who simply will not accept Jesus Christ as king. There are many who won't. And an all-knowing God knows all things. Otherwise, he doesn't know all things. He knows who won't accept him and who will accept him. And the gospel is offered to all, but not all will accept it. The real question in that debate is not in understanding the balance between sovereignty and responsibility. You can tie yourself up in all kinds of knots over trying to gain a good grasp over it. The simple truth is that scripture teaches both and portrays both, starting when the serpent tempted Eve into eating that apple. Explain how that happened. God's grace serves as this bridge between the two sides of this debate because both sides are absolutely right. They're absolutely right. But you have God's grace to bridge the gap in between. And at some point, he may show us how that actually works when we're in heaven. Maybe he won't. But at the base of it, such a debate, such wrestling, trying to find reason and the difference between the two truths, that debate will not save you. It will not cause you to lose your salvation. It's not going to save anybody else either. The real question, the one we should spend our time on and our thought on and our prayer on, is whether or not you accept him. Whether or not the person next door will accept him. What do you personally and individually say of the claims of Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him as your savior? And if not, will you accept him as your savior? I'm telling you this morning, the time is now. You flat out may not get another shot. He brought you here this morning. So the question is, what are you going to do with it? Verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And this was common. Jews of the time, they would often shake the dust from their feet when leaving a Gentile town. And that's not the spirit behind what Paul and Barnabas are doing here. But that's how a Jew felt about their relationship in comparison with Gentiles. The, even the dirt was dirtier in a Gentile city. Um, you shake all the uncleanness off. But you had Jesus in Mark chapter 6, verse 11, who told his disciples to shake their feet from the dust of any town that would not accept or listen to them. Basically, it's not on you if anybody accepts this message or not. But it is on us to share the word. The decision is on the receiving party. The Holy Spirit reveals and teaches, and he is really, really, really good at that. But we can really beat ourselves up over whether we said the right thing or the wrong thing, or if we had incomplete answers for somebody or if we didn't have answers for somebody. Sometimes we'll think of the perfect thing we should have said as soon as we walk away from that conversation, and we really beat ourselves up over it. Maybe we have that realization even later that night, or a week later, gosh, if I would have had that. But the thing is, the Lord didn't have it for you to say in that moment. And God can work with any series of words, and he shows that throughout his word, any length. Remember Peter entering the centurion's house just a couple weeks ago. You had Peter who had heard every single one of Jesus' teachings and his parables. He saw the life lived out. He saw the example. He had a wealth of everything right to say about everything. And he also had a propensity to say too much. And all he really got out in that moment was through the name of Jesus, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. And the Holy Spirit in that moment cut him off. And fell upon everybody in that room who heard that word. And a great movement happened. Don't miss that that's essentially the identical message the Gentiles latched onto in this city, here in chapter 13. You have the example of Jonah in the Old Testament. All he got out was yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of the nation believed. Out of those eight words, eight words that don't mention God, and don't mention Jesus, eight words that made it all the way to the king. 
And he issued a decree for all to cry mightily to the God of this man to turn and relent. God takes care of the words. I believe, personally, he can transform the words once they leave our mouths. He can turn it into a trigger in each heart that hears them exactly the way he needs them to hear it. Because he knows their hearts and their past. He gives the words. And from us, all he is looking for is a willingness and a readiness to represent him wherever we are. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to close with this. You know this verse already. We've been over this verse, but I just want you to see it again. I don't think we can see it enough. First book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 10. Verse 18. And this is Jesus. He says, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. And again, here's Jesus saying, you will be going to the Gentiles with this. (laughs) It's been there all along. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. My challenge to you this week, it's a hard challenge, let God speak wherever you go, and then watch what he does with it. You will be amazed. If you want to come up for prayer afterward, we're going to have uh, elders down here. If the Lord spoke to your heart, if you are going through a time of emptiness or dryness, if you have not encountered the Lord Jesus before, come up. Let us pray with you. We'll get you a Bible. We'll get you going. The Lord will do the work in your heart, though. Just surrender yourself to it. Again, you might not get another shot, any one of us. Don't take for granted the day that you've been given right now. Let's go ahead and pray. And Father God, we, um, we are grateful for who you are. And just for your patience to us, Lord, to continue to foster us along. And the fact that you're always drawing us closer, Lord, that you're so forgiving. You have such mercy on each one of our lives. We just, we want to be of use in your hands. We want to be equipped and we want to have the right words, Lord. And we just ask in the encounters that you give us, even in the coming week, that you would be the one who speaks through us. That we wouldn't have a perfectly planned out script with people, that we'd allow your spirit to lead what is said. And uh, and in that moment, Lord, that we'd allow your spirit to do the work that transforms lives. And uh, we just, we we give our lives into that effort. We ask for your protection. We ask for peace, Lord. And just peace in our day-to-day lives. And, and the people that we come into contact with, they be able to see the peace you're able to give. We pray for our community. And Lord, as there are people who are hopeless, uh, we pray that you'd be preparing their hearts just to hear your word and that you'd be opening eyes to who you are. And that, Lord, for every excuse somebody might have for not believing and not following after you, you would overwhelm those things. That you would just compel believers to your throne room so that you might be worshiped and glorified. So we give that to you. We ask that you do a mighty work in this body of believers, in your body across the world, Lord, that your church would just be rising up and representing who you are everywhere you are. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.
Jacob.